And housing just has to be a top of mind issue locally, state, and in terms of on a federal basis, because it's one of those aspects in going out and supporting ourselves. We go and a lot of times base our decisions in work and career off of housing. Mm-hmm. And we have this fundamental disconnect that a lot of times where the abundance of jobs, San Francisco, Los Angeles, San Diego, New York City, Boston, is some of the most unaffordable places to live. But yet they're the most prosperous in abundance of opportunities. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Ascending Thoughts, the show where we discuss the issues of the day and the strategies of how to overcome them so that we can ascend to greater personal and business success. My name is Brian, and I'm here with our host, Mr. William Rogers, the voice of reason in these tumultuous times and renowned business owner and advisor. Mr. Rogers, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Brian. It's a beautiful day to podcast. Welcome, everyone. Let's welcome our neighbors out there who are joining us virtually and locally, and let's get to have a wonderful discussion about the issues of the day. That sounds good. Starting off the previous show, we talked about a little bit about inflation. I want to do a break back into that and just give us a little recap of temporary inflation and structural inflation and the roles that they play in today. It's a very relevant topic as you're talking about, especially in today's news, because the Federal Reserve is meeting today and most indications point that they're going to raise short term interest rates again as a means to tamp down this out of control inflation. One of the things that I was referencing and as we're trying to educate the people out there is we have to be able to delineate between what is temporary as we see the rise in our gas pump, as Mm -hmm. we see at the grocery store and around what we're paying as consumers, but other aspects that are more permanent or structural that will still be there after prices fall that's been embedded in there. So temporary is when we kind of look at it, as you've seen in many consumers throughout, they're noticing that prices of the pump are starting to go down. And many people are starting to see some relief. They're still high, but they're noticing that it's been starting to taper off. You're also noticing is that people are starting to change habits versus whether it's dining out, whether it's traveling, going to movie theaters and shopping. We're starting to see it in some consumer data and those type of prices will come down. These are all embedded in those factors as we went as most of you know. During that time in COVID, as people were staying at home, we pumped tremendous amounts, trillions of dollars in relief money into the economy. So consumers had the purchasing power Mm -hmm. to go out and spend. So that creates a temporary factor that you're going to pen up a lot of demand. You're going to have a lot of online sellers who were beneficiaries of those traffic and thinking that's going on. That's an example of something that's temporary. There's only so much you can buy, but if I give you an extra boost of money outside of what you have in your normal salary, you're going to have that blip, but then it tapers off. So that's kind of that tapering off effect, as well as how we're evolving out of COVID. A lot of the goods that we rely upon come from overseas, whether you're thinking of the computer chips, you're thinking of apparel, you're thinking of consumer electronics. Almost most goods come from a global supply chain, and we're still, we've been grappling with those different, what we call lockdowns or different types of impacts what COVID-19 has had in largely in Asian markets. And as they're starting to come out of that, supply starts to improve in those bottlenecks. So what were previously shortages drives up prices. Now we start to get supply and demands come down. So they meet in that natural equilibrium. However, when you push that all away, the bigger macro long-term forces that have been there that will continue to be there and that we have seen are the structural forces of inflation that we as consumers, as people, as citizens need to be aware of and voice how we can change. Some of the primary ones and one of them that we'll struck, we'll focus on today is the cost of housing. 
And so when we think of in terms of housing and many people of your cohorts, as you're trying to go out and rent Mm -hmm. an apartment and live on your own, you notice that the rent of a one bedroom, two bedroom apartment has become exorbitant. And it's not just in San Diego in most places of where you go and throughout the U.S. Someone, a family who's getting ready to buy a home. That in terms of in that structural impact when we think of inflation as it's kind of gone up. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to talk about that and with the structural inflation and the cost of everything's going up, how does that trickle down effect come to, for example, someone of your generation and then someone of my generation that we're seeing it a little bit more as opposed to someone who's older than myself? So let's take, for example, housing is one of the what we call big forces of inflation because we have multiple forces health care cost of education child care when you Mm -hmm. have kids these are what i call big structural forces of inflation that have been there for decades so in terms of the cost of housing this is very much a generational rift because as you'll look at those who are older who are able to buy a home They've been beneficiaries of a rise in home values, so they have a what we call a wealth effect. But the challenge is when you look at the trickle down, the generation before, and you get to the very earlier generation, they get priced out. So it becomes a conundrum of you have harder and harder as you get to each younger generation, because if I'm at the oldest end of the spectrum, let's take, for example, in San Diego, in your parents' community, If I'm at the oldest end of the spectrum in that community, I was a beneficiary when it was cheap. And then you fast forward, if I stayed in there 20 years, I'm wealthy on paper. The next generation coming in around your parents and in my age, we struggled and we bought it, but we're in debt. And we come to the generation before as those are trying to come in, it's like, we don't have the income, we don't have the down payment, and it's just totally untenable. And that is basically a generational divide. The overall conundrum is when we look at housing as an issue, we keep on trying to do the same thing. And when I say in terms of trying to do the same thing is we think the answer is single family homes. My parents had a single family home. I have to have a single family home. The next generation. And what we have is when you're looking at it in an issue of supply and demand, land values go up. Builders are going to tell you and be honest, you've got the price of materials that it goes in. People's taste and what they expect is what was a home in the 1970s was different in the 80s and 90s versus now. What we call the different finishes, which is many years ago viewed and perceived as luxurious. Now in today's culture are expected. So you have that piling into the cost of housing. And in addition, you're also going to have many people is in a natural cost is you have the cost of permits and permitting and what you can do. So that all factors into the overall price economics of making a single family home. And most of all, when you're talking and making in a single family home, You're talking in one family. So how much land you're taking, how much resources, but the name of the game to have affordable housing, unfortunately, we have to address the problem that no one wants to address. And that is higher density housing. And the reason that we have been so reluctant historically is because a lot of housing and real estate is very local about maintaining a certain community and Mm -hmm. image and thus we have this constant not in my backyard sentiment so for example you're going to have groups older generations or whoever and if you want to create a solution that's going to benefit a whole you have to be accepting of part of the prescription of that we may have to have apartment buildings and high rises in your neighborhood then all of a sudden people are like (gasps) I don't want that. I Mm -hmm. want to maintain my sidewalks. I want to maintain my green lawns. But what people don't fundamentally realize, it's creating the problem and time bomb that we have now that's unsustainable. And with those higher density areas for those people that from those older generations, it's going to come with more doors, more people, more cars, more traffic in those city areas or those suburbs for travel. Because that's where the jobs are when they go into the cities. 
and as opposed to the older mentality of quality of life when people are moving and you're thinking and the life and this is the natural tension that's going on but if you're truly wanting to get at the root cause of what's best for the whole the best of society we have to come together and reconcile in terms of this issue and all make some sacrifices the notion we have created a culture in america in the post-world war ii generation that everyone should have their own home with a lawn, a picket fence, and we have perpetuated this ideal of creating suburban neighborhoods. The challenge is economically, it's not sustainable. The amount of water, resources, utilities, there's only so much land. And we're still, we can't build enough housing for the demand. And in many of these communities, as you said, people want to enjoy, they don't want crowded streets. They don't want noise. Many of these can be eyesores. You put all of those together and it creates a fundamental conundrum. But we have to accept the reality. We have to have some sort of balance where we Mm -hmm. have a degree and acceptance of higher density usage. We have to have the conversation because Mm -hmm. all we're doing is ducking our head in the sand. You can't build your way. We cannot kid ourselves that if we build 100,000 single family homes, a million single family homes, the average price point's not going to dip below Mm -hmm. where a person and a young professional can afford. We'll build the homes, but when you put all the cost factors, land, what it costs, building permits, time, zoning, utilities, the finishes of what everyone wants, the medium price is still going to be high. And it's going to take years to get there. And it's going to take years to get there. But when you look to other countries, you go in Europe, you go in Asia, you're noticing higher density usage. Why is it only in America we insist on having a suburban community? It is not sustainable. At least in those big cities and everything like that, I completely see what you're saying. And for the suburbs and the towns that are more rural, that's fine. But for these higher density areas where you are transiting into the cities for those jobs, those bigger companies, there needs to be some sort of middle ground of the suburban areas to that more dense areas, but yet you don't want it to have a dense area that's unsafe to all the patrons. Without a doubt, but this is where we have to have an honest discussion. We have to go balance all in terms of stakeholders If you look in the evolution in a lot of the communities of where we're living at in San Diego is no different in a lot of communities out in across America. There are some aspects of that when we have in our downtown, that's the trapping of a big city. But if you take Carlsbad and Vista and some of the others, which were very much viewed as bedroom communities, what has happened in the last 23 years? They brought in a lot of industry. We have an amusement Mm -hmm. park here. We have many Mm -hmm. major corporations. We also have a small airport. As a result, it's become a job center. So it's not a one size fits all when you take in Mm -hmm. one community. They have to look at a fundamental reality is what are you doing? You've created a job center. Do you want to just go push the entire workforce 90 minutes away, two hours away, three hours away? For those essential jobs that are providing The services, what's happening? Because again, we're in a tourist destination. Mm -hmm. There are people who have to work in those amusement parks, Mm -hmm. in those retail stores, in those restaurants, in those hotels. They need to be close enough to their work. We just Mm -hmm. can't forget about them and say, well, they're magically going to appear. That's my point. It's an honest discussion at looking at the whole aspect. Obviously, no one wants their entire neighborhoods and their parks all of a sudden what they had peace and serenity how we put around surrounded by massive apartment complexes but we also have to be honest about a balanced community yeah yeah and we cannot push a larger and larger group of people clogging our highways some of those points were so interesting and they just hit home so much uh, being from this area and seeing it over the years of my life of how that is those fundamental problems are increasing more and more. They are, but it was just one of the examples of where I wanted to highlight is where some of in our challenges today, and when I talk about being a voice of reason, 
and trying to educate the public, we need to tackle tough issues. And to tackle tough issues, we need to build consensus. But there's also, as we're going about it, we have to reconcile some inherent, what we call inequities in our society. Whether there's going to be racial and social, one aspect is we do have a generational divide. As you get older in the spectrum, you naturally will have more wealth and assets. When you're younger in the spectrum, you're starting off in debt, you're struggling to get by, and the fundamental challenge as we talk about in reaching that American dream is will you be able to be self-supportive? And housing is one of the most basic elements in that question and how this is where we as a people, not necessarily federally in its state, but this is where in a local area, local government, of how we that gets addressed in local zoning laws and 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 urban and planning and how they they build in terms of and design these communities so that those as in your generation have a fair shot that you have a fair shot of getting in versus being locked out because Mm. it it creates an untenable situation that the older generation because they got it cheap that they're all of a sudden a windfall by staying in their property and doing nothing, right? 20 yeah. years later, but you're here out working. And remember, many of our packs in society are based upon social contracts between the generations. Mm-hmm. The most common example, social security. Older generations, property owners who have assets, they're largely drawing upon social security, which they worked throughout mm-hmm. their lives and they deserve But to sustain that is requiring younger generations like yourself to pay into it, sustains it in the belief that when you get to the age, you'll be taken care of. That's called a social pact, social contract. The thing is, from that moral perspective, we need to also look at housing in a similar fashion versus what we have in our culture. Housing has become very much an investment and a money-making device. And part of the consequence is it's pushing out and creating more of a generational rift. Yeah, and where I see it from my point of view is, will I be able to get to where my parents were during that age that when they were able to purchase a home and be able to sustain that quality of life? Or is that five years down the road or even 10 years down the road in my life? And, and for many fears and people who I talk to on a daily basis, some are fearful that they may never attain it in yeah, their yeah. lifetime. That yeah. we're getting to that point. It, it, yeah, it could be in my generation or the next generation. I'm not sure. But it definitely is for sure something that comes to mind if you really think deep down about it. And it's scary. It is. And this is where when we always talk about the power of voting, We vote every day on how we spend our money, but we also have to be engaged in one of those issues. And housing just has to be a top of mind issue locally, state, and in terms of on a federal basis, because it's one of those aspects in going out and supporting ourselves. We go and a lot of times base our decisions in work and career off of housing. And we have this fundamental disconnect that a lot of times where the abundance of jobs, San Francisco, Los Angeles, San Diego, New York City, Boston, is some of the most unaffordable places to live. But yet they're the most prosperous and abundance of opportunities. We have this wide diversion. When we look at the more affordable, we have the least availability of opportunities. So some of them, technology, we have in terms of a boom, people will be able to work remotely and it will resolve in that element of Mm -hmm. those in a workforce who have that ability to work from anywhere, they can be a beneficiary, but that's not a solution for the whole. There is always going to be an element of the economy that is frontline that has to work face to face and be on the ground. And if where the demand is that we talk in terms of in a major metropolitan city like New York city, Los Angeles, you have to also provide housing so that a workforce can afford mm-hmm. to live in the community that they're working in. Yeah. Yeah. The, and I view the it a national priority versus something mm-hmm. that we just brush under the rug. Yeah. 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 I agree with that. Switching topics here. What are some of the things that just the individual can do or what can they implement in their lives to help 
adapt to the structural inflation that we're seeing that is rising just a little bit? So in the power of voting is we as consumers is we have to push back on what we want. So part of one, let's take the example in terms of in housing, what's been the pile on effect is that we've gotten more and more buying on to the cultural effect of what's called keeping up with the Joneses. You watch TV and there are popular shows that you like to watch from the 1970s, 1980s, and up until current of sitcoms. Pay very close attention to what the home look like. What used to be austere to, and I'm not talking in terms of an affluent rich family, of the typical middle-class family, you're noticing how ornate and bigger and massive the entryways, the uh -huh. kitchens and everything is. There's a cost behind that. There's always in terms of cost and incomes have not kept up. And we as consumers have to push back versus what's necessary, putting a roof over our heads and what's a luxury. And we do have a choice in that matter because obviously again, consumerism is one of those aspects that is creating the predicament and environment that we're in. And we have to recognize our participation in that of blindly going with the flow and assuming this is the way it's got to be in the way it's always been. No, you have that power. You get to choose how you spend your money and whether it's truly necessary in your relationship, in your family, and as well as along in your personal life. Yeah. And with regards to housing, as I grow older, it seems like everything, everything is on the up and up and up, but yet do you really need that? Do you really need that 4,000 square foot home? Or the extra pantry or the second oven. You can use that home office, that's fine, but do you need that spare bedroom or you can consolidate it to Correct. the home office and the spare bedroom together with a lower square but footage home. But also in addition, take a look at what we're doing in kitchens, not just mm -hmm. the ornate of the backsplashes, of the countertops, it's all, full those, all the hardware that goes into it. It's everything. When you look around at 360, light mm -hmm. fixtures, furniture, again, this is what erodes at consumers their incomes because all i'm just pointing out was 30 and 40 years ago the typical middle class family did not give thought of that it was mm -hmm. relatively plain vanilla and spartan am i trying to be someone who's saying that i'm totally the antichrist of that i'm just trying to educate in terms of the public I have an MBA. I, I, I'm a business in terms of person, but I also find in mm -hmm. terms of responsibility is to educate and inform consumers and that you have a choice. Those are things, if you want to buy it and dress up and style your home, understand that is not your choice. Don't feel as you have to fall into the trap. And mm -hmm. many people have been programmed as you have to understand in basic economics is driven largely by consumer decisions and behavior. But mm -hmm. consumer be behavior and decisions, we have to recognize we make the choice. We can't just go blindly. Yeah. And the majority I feel nowadays, and as I've gotten older and more into my adulthood, I feel now that I can see that. And the majority of choices, they're going exponential. Years and years ago, a kitchen with a fridge and a sink and a pantry was just fine. Now you have people with six burner stoves, so many other wine fridges in their kitchen everything right. so many just extraneous things but in reality do you need those basic things to just yes. get by and survive yes and much of when you start to unpack in american culture we are a highly marketed culture mm -hmm. in other words any show that you watch any post any podcast that is you're always going to be inundated with marketing messages you see about a new air fryer, about a new home gym, about these new kitchen utensils. You see this consumerism over and over. And we as very much in terms of as people mindlessly end up buying into that. But all I'm just trying to do is to educate is the public out there. Time out. Mm. Step back. Look, you have a choice in that. Do you have to have it? Mm -hmm. Because that's how you can fundamentally and change your life and ascend to greater success and then continuing on that topic i feel that once you get that little stepping stone of is it a need versus a want yes you can live your life more simply but with the brain time and time again repetition instead of 
grasping for those things that are extraneous and those wants and just exorbitant, those basic needs over time, you're going to just get into purchasing only those things and your life is going to be moving on that path. And let's address in terms of something what we have been hearing a lot in terms of amongst conversations, amongst a lot of friends and family members, and we hear out there, we hear about this growing and growing mental health crisis. Have we ever thought and give deep introspection for a moment that if we can all of a sudden distinguish between needs and wants, we can then rechannel living a life of purpose, we can fundamentally start to address why there's this growing feeling of mm-hmm. emptiness and depression that's out there. Because if we continuously try to chase this ideal of keeping up with the Joneses, keeping up with the Kardashians, it ends up becoming something a game will never win. And thus it's going to further pile on this depression that people is feeling that's that's pervasive out there and that's just it's a never-ending cycle instead of it, it identifying isn't because the problem. you're trying to imitate something that's not real versus identifying with your own needs and what f- provides you as an individual fulfillment spiritually emotionally mm-hmm. yeah yeah you need to look at yourself in the mirror and yes ask yourself and identify what yes. are the problems if you're feeling this way what actual items can you do so that you are feeling better instead of Well, I need to keep up with the Joneses because on television, I saw this and this. But also in addition, we have the pile on because in today's society, because of social media, their followers and what your friends are doing, and we're constantly being judged. We can't turn it off. So you have that playing into people's Mm -hmm. mental scripts all the time versus in years past and in my age, you just looked around, you viewed Mm -hmm. peers visually. Mm -hmm. Now you have it on social media flaring Mm -hmm. at you every day when a post and a feed comes out. It just further perpetuates. And it's just so instant in your brain. You see everything coming up. And, you know, like you said, years and years ago, if you saw somebody wearing a t-shirt that you like, you'd go up to them and say, hey, where did you get that t-shirt? Or the new car that they were sporting Mm -hmm. a few doors down. But now you you, you go on Instagram and it's just, wow, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. And it's just instant in your brain. You need all of that information and that gets your brain going. And when we actually step back and look at this as a community, now we start to understand how we as a whole in a group start to embed and solidify structural inflation because we did not challenge or question that ideal. We accepted it as a given. Yeah. In other words, we ducked our head in the sand and mm-hmm. we didn't question it. So thus housing tends mm-hmm. to perpetuate and we kept keep repeating the same formula. Yeah. And it- when we get into college education, higher education, we get into childcare, we get into healthcare, we get into so many different facets and break it down. You can start to start to see how we as consumers feed into that and it gets cemented. And you said a line that for me re- resonates, excuse me, is that you didn't question it and you didn't question it because it takes effort. Why is it that we have single family homes that are 3,000 square feet instead of condos or apartment complexes for these lower income workers and everything. That's just how it is. And it's been that way for Correct. for 50 years instead of wondering, well, we have a problem of the housing and with the inflation, but can we question why and who do we question? And also, can we be open alternative ideas? Because mm-hmm. a lot of times as we get along in terms of society, we grow more and more stubborn. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the things that we have to do is we have tough challenges that we all have to collectively face, whether it's global warming, lack of water, lack of in terms of affordable housing, the cost of college education, all those rampant gun violence. We have to, to in order to solve them, we have to come together and to come together. We have to question first and foremost, why we keep doing the same old thing. Because that's the definition of insanity. It is. But again, this is what continues to perpetuate in terms of in these problems that they just go along and we continue to kick the can down the road. And it's only a, a matter of time until you can kick that can and then all of a sudden there's a wall and it has nowhere else to go. Correct. Or the other alternative is, unfortunately, and what we're trying to push back in terms of in serving the community and the public good mm-hmm. is you can create division. 
Yeah. And division creates a distraction by getting each other riled up against each other. The overall problem that's lurking above people forgotten about. And that is the typical when you're trying to tackle these massive forces, because mm -hmm. there are in terms of various when you get into whether it's housing, healthcare, you get into firearms, you get into college education, you start to peel back certain forces that are beneficiary benefit from the system and continuing the way that it is. And it behooves of them in their financial interest to keep it that way. Because if we come together and basically address the problem and rectify it, they will lose out. And find the solution, yeah. Exactly. The only way is to keep us divided, be at each other's throats. Yeah, yeah. So that's powerful words. <laughs> powerful words. But we certainly don't want everybody to be divided. We want everybody to come together for the common good so that everybody can ascend to greater heights so that they can live their life to their fullest potential. And that is also, too, what's the inspiration of this show, uh -huh. Brian, is that I, as I grew up with, with uh, public broadcasting and watching Mr. Rogers, Sesame Street, of all in terms of those shows, there was a certain amount of values that we learned. And we just think that in terms of as you fast forward to today, those that were kids are now adults and parents, mm -hmm. that we need to bring and refresh those values in today's world and mm -hmm. employ them. Because unfortunately, there's just way too much vitriol and vile that's being stirred up out there. And we are not going to participate in that. We're not here to establish a cult of celebrity. We're mm -hmm. here to educate people. We don't want to provide misinformation and conspiracy theories. We want to lie and discuss and rest upon facts. Mm -hmm. also want to have engaging discussions. We mm -hmm. don't want to alienate in terms of people, mm -hmm. but that's why in terms of truth matters. And we're going to be guided by principles of honesty and decency. But this is how, by having these ethical principles, we can have these discussions. And the purpose is so that we can engage in these discussions and educate and consensus build. So as we become united, we can become a growing driving force to tackle the issues of the time. Yeah. And then just sit, sit next to the person that you're with as if they're, if they are a stranger and just come together with honesty, openness, and integrity. And sometimes you got to bite your tongue at some things, but that's just life. What's going to be the solution to all of these problems and nobody's going to be happy. We can't help everybody. But what we can do is we can really try to just help out the most we can by instilling these values and these solutions to some of these problems. Yeah, as Dr. Martin Luther King once said, the arc of justice tends to bend right in terms of the right towards justice in the long term. And all what we're just trying to do as people and as citizens mm -hmm. and of people of good conscience yeah. is what we can participate in in that common good through our daily lives to help bend that arc of justice towards righteousness. Because there are, in terms of in these issues, as I, as a business advisor, goes hand in hand, I care about the community that I live in and want that people can live and work in this community. They have to be able to afford it. Also, in addition, when we talk about in future shows, the cost of educating that workforce so that they're not in, in debt that is just basically something that they'll never get out of. And finally, when people start having in terms of kids, that cost of child care and what that means in that. Yeah, those are all great points. Looks like we're sort of wrapping up on time here. Is there anything that you'd like to end the show with? Any takeaways or anything like that? For yeah, the in terms of, you know, when we look in terms of some action items and when we're talking about structural inflation, number one is identify my choices in those specific items of how I participate in and question it. What I can do differently in, in my needs and versus in my wants. More importantly, by you taking an active role, you are voting every day with how you spend your money. And the market needs to adjust accordingly if enough of us are changing what our wants are because we've better aligned them with our needs. And finally, again, we have to vote. Many of these issues, again, 
is part of a reflection in public policy and in government, and we just can't be apathetic and leave it up to a select few with what builders want, with what a group of older, in terms of residents and communities, we have to participate so that everyone's voices as stakeholders get heard and reflected so that what we're doing in terms of in planning and building is more reflective to the needs of the community versus reflective of a small group of interests. That's great. Closing up, everyone, I want to thank Mr. Rogers for another episode of Thoughts. And uh, thank you all for watching. I'm Brian, and I will see you uh, see you next time. Thank you, everyone.